We're living in a day and a time in which it seems to be becoming increasingly difficult uh, for us to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. And we have taken things which the Bible defines as sin, and, and we not only tolerate them, but we celebrate them, and we seem to promote them in our culture. And not only do we seem to have lost our moral compass, but we see an increasing trend, I think, toward a loss of religious freedoms, and, gov- and there's government pressure to adhere to unbiblical views. Um, and this is not just in America, this is around the world, uh, that those who espout biblical views are often called bigoted or hateful. In some cases, uh, they've been prosecuted for hate speech. So I think it would be natural for us to kind of long for the good old days, right? Back when we were kids, things were not so bad. But you know what? Even the good old days had trouble. Even in the early days of Christianity, they faced a lot of the same problems that we face today. And the short letter that we're looking at this morning uh, was addressed to the church and, and talked about how to deal with some of those pressures. So as we continue our series, Small Books with Big Messages, uh, we're going to look at 2 John today. If you don't know where that is, it's right after 1 John and right before 3 John. <laughs> if, if, if you get to Jude or Revelation, you've gone too far. So it's, it's way towards the end there. Uh, It's a short letter. It could have been a postcard in those days, uh, but it's full of some rich instruction. Let's read uh, verse 1. The elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one that we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them, shares in their wicked work. I have much to write you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. So as we start to look at the greetings and the blessings here, the author is John the Apostle. He just simply refers to himself as the elder here. He was the youngest disciple of Jesus's. And so now he's an old man. He's probably on the island of Patmos at this time. Uh, But the term emphasizes his position and his personal relationship with the readers. It tells us that they were quite familiar with him, that they knew who the author was. He had a special position as the last surviving apostle. He's the only one that died a natural death. Uh, The others had been martyred. Um, But the church knew who he was, and so he could appeal to them in a gentle fashion rather than having to pull rank. There's, you notice there's no, I am the last soul apostle, so I'm sending you some wisdom that you should follow. It's just, hey, it's the elder. It's the old guy. His standing, his respect, and his authority were well established to the people that he was writing. And he writes to the chosen lady and her children. This is a unique opening. Most of the letters uh, have more than that, um, because it's kind of vague and he just says the chosen lady and her children, there is a lot of debate about, well, who is this lady? Uh, some people think it's a reference to a literal person and her children. I don't think the tone of the letter reads that way at all. Uh, others, and this is the group I would tend to agree with, um, see it as a figurative reference to a local church and his members. He's writing to a specific church uh, that way. Chosen lady is a term of endearment. And respect, before time, 
God chose how salvation would be won and how it would be offered. And so those who accept the gift are chosen. The church is the bride of Christ. And so just like someone would choose to wed the one they love, the church is the chosen love of Christ. She's chosen because God chose her to belong to himself. Now, there are two key words that drive this letter that, that, that John pitches here in his in introduction, love and truth. John establishes an intimate nature with his readers. He's going to appeal to their heart and to their emotions, which will make them more receptive to the instruction he has to give. Whom I love in the truth <clears throat> is an emphatic phrase and in the present tense, so it carries the sense of um, this group whom I myself love is a constant expression of my heart. You just, what a great context for a pastor to share truth from. It's for love for the congregation rather than a, uh, an impersonal, harsh manner. If love would appeal to their hearts, then truth is going to appeal to their minds. There's no letter, I don't think, in the New Testament that balances those twin Christian graces of love and truth probably more beautifully than, than 2 John. John's concern for the church is certainly for the whole church, but it's also relational and it's individual. He loves this community personally and devotedly. His heart is knit to theirs. It's not just sentiment and emotion. Truth is the framework the principle that guides and it gives genuine meaning to the expression of his love. And John knew that both love and truth were essential. In the past, well, let me back up. Truth mattered to John. If deception and error slip into the fellowship, then the results are always tragic and devastating. The reason for this dedication to the truth is that it binds them together as a permanent and abiding reality. It's the truth that binds us together as a church. In the past, John and his fellow witnesses came to know the truth. The truth was the person of Jesus Christ. And the result of that experience had stayed with them to the present, and it was going to stay with them forever. And for those that know Christ, that know the truth, they truly love each other as a practice of their faith. And then John offers a triple blessing, beginning with grace. Grace is God's unearned favor and his undeserved kindness. It's, it's everything that a holy and righteous God does for sinners that they don't deserve. It speaks of God's compassion and his pity, his tenderness, his readiness to forgive sin. Mercy is, is God not giving the sinner what they deserve. Our, our sin deserves punishment. Our sin deserves death. And God, through Jesus, does not give that to us. He offers us a different way. Peace is a term that emphasizes the wholeness and the well-being of life in all its aspects. It conveys the idea of safety, of rest, the absence of hostility. So grace is God doing for us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not doing for us what we do deserve. And peace is God giving us what we need based on his grace and mercy. That word order is important. God's grace is always first. And mercy and peace flow from it. And this is important. John points out that these three blessings come from God and from Jesus Christ. God the Son. The repetition of that preposition from is important here. And it's an early response to the false teaching that he's going to talk about a little bit later. By stating it this way, he is placing the Father and the Son on equal standing. At the same time, establishing their separate personhood. It's the great mystery of the Trinity, right? How can we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit? And they're three different personalities, but they're God. They're all God. You can't have one without the others. Our spiritual blessings flow equally from the Father and the Son and the Spirit. In any theology that would set the Father in opposition to the Son or the Spirit is faulty theology. When I was a campus minister, we had a girl. Um, I was in Richmond, Virginia, and her parents had just moved to Kansas City, and they found out her mom had cancer. 
And so she had prayed about it, and she felt like it, that, that God's will was for her to move to Kansas City, drop out of school and be with her mom during that time. And she shared that with the group, and then some well-meaning, strange person went to her and said, well, God may have said that, but did the Holy Spirit say that? Which led me and my fellow campus minister to debate of, is the Trinity a democracy? Like, do you have to have a two out of three vote to, to know if it's God's will? Like, no, that, that was totally heretical. The Spirit, the Father, the Son agree. So when you pray and you feel like God has said, this is what you should do, there's not been a, there's not been a debate, there's not been a vote taken. That's God the Trinity revealing his will to, will to you. And so anything that teaches anything different than that is a lie. It's just not to be found in Scripture anywhere. In fact, quite the opposite is true. So John continues, and he says, I want you to walk in love. That paragraph beginning with verse 4, it shows, I think it shows more of John's love for his congregation, for this church. He had come into contact with some of their community, and he had found them to be walking with God. Now, I have to tell you, there's some people that get hung up, and they hear that phrase, I have found some of your children walking in the truth, and like, oh, that means that some were not. Right? I think he's talking about, I ran into some of the people from your church. Like if, if uh, you were at the fair, you saw the Dodds, and you saw me later in the week, you said, hey, I saw some of your church at the fair. Well, okay, so we know not all of the church was at the fair, but that doesn't mean like some of your church didn't go to the fair with the Dodds. He's just talking about, I ran into some of the people from your church, and it was so cool because they're walking with God. It's awesome. The other doesn't fit the tone of the letter because there's no following criticism. There's no rebuke. There's just affirmation here. I met some of your church members recently. I was impressed that they were the real deal. It does give us joy, right? When we meet godly people who are walking with God, you come away blessed, right? They're exemplifying God in their lives. They're exemplifying Christ in their lives. And you come away going like, wow, that was really cool. That was fun. It's so much better than when you run across somebody that tells you that they have a relationship with Christ and then you see them being ungodly in the way they respond to somebody or doing something they should, probably shouldn't be doing. And you leave going like, ooh, wow. John's saying, they reflected well on you. They got a good reputation. It, it, uh, it cultivates the reputation that your church has for being devoted to Christ. Walking in the truth that John mentions indicates that the truth is not just what we believe, but it's also how we live. It's, it's doctrine and duty. One writer put it this way, what we live is what we believe. Everything else is just religious talk. So when he's talking about them walking in love, he wants them to walk in love, but he says it's also important because you're walking in the truth. They're walking in the truth. They're living their faith. I think one of the problems that we struggle with today, <coughs> and one of the things that, that differentiates us sometimes from the early church in Acts, we love to tell people what we believe. But we see in the early church, they lived what they believed. And then John gives his, his first instruction. He says, love one another. Since you're walking in the truth, I want you to walk in love. How are you going to do that? I want you to love one another. It's a word of encouragement. It's an expression of, of personal joy. It's, it's a word for the whole body of believers. And he says, it's not a new command. It's just a reminder, which sets him apart from the false teachers who had, we have a new thing to tell you. And John's like, no, I'm just going to remind you of the same thing Jesus said. You, you've known this from the beginning. This is, we've been talking about this. John doesn't believe necessarily that the old is bad and the new is good. You know, some folks, they want to be so progressive, they just keep throwing away whatever's in the back and they just keep taking the new stuff. And John's like, no, the old stuff's pretty good. He's not against growth. He's not against 
being progressive, but he's saying, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because we learned at the very beginning that we're supposed to love each other. Truth is truth, regardless of its age. And, and all truth ultimately finds its source in God, because God is truth. And John is, says this is something that they learn from Jesus way at the beginning. He taught them, you know, uh, he reiterated the night that he was betrayed. He said, I got a new command for you. I want you to love one another. Here, John is calling for a consistent expression of love, to love and to keep loving. Not like, well, I love somebody once. I did something nice for somebody last week. I guess I'm good for a while. He's like, no, that should be a lifestyle. That should be as you continue, as you go. Walking in the truth and love for one another go hand in hand. The absence of one will ensure the absence of the other. And if we love God, we will love each other. By loving each other, we're loving God. In his gospel, John had quoted Jesus as saying this. Jesus replied, this is John 14, 23 and 24. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. The command to love each other is a recurring theme in scriptures. It was given in the Old Testament. Jesus repeated it. Jesus repeated it. Jesus repeated it over and over again. Because God is love. And when we love, we are most like him. We show love by caring for people, by accepting, by listening, by helping, giving, serving, spending time with people. We all, we all know that we should love one another, but we have to put the commandment into daily practice. John tied our love for God together with our love for people this way in 1 John. 1 John 4.20 said, For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God, whom they have not seen. We cannot separate our love from God from our obedience. We cannot separate our love from God for our love for others. If you hate people, there is a problem in your relationship with God. If you're hateful to people, there's a problem in your relationship to God. We need to hear that. Not just hear it, we need to live that. Like it kills me. I don't do Facebook very much. I would never be on Facebook if I didn't have to post our videos on there. But it kills me on Facebook with folks that I know to be church members, not church members here, but church members, people I've worked with and other Christian context, and I see the vitriol in their Facebook posts, and I think, ah, please don't claim to be a Christian. Just keep that a secret between you and God, because you are wrecking his reputation. We're going to see here that truth is important, so we can't just say, like, well, we'll just tolerate everything. That's not what we're saying, but we're saying that we're all sinners, and so we got to love each other, Right? God's the only perfect one. He's the only one that has a right to go like, well, you stink. Right? Your sin is wretched. But God gave us a solution to that. But we don't have that right. Because we are not God. And he says, I'm love. And so I want you to love. So John goes on and he says, okay, truth is important, though. I want you to walk in love, but truth is really important. This is why love is important. This is the issue that, that prompted the letter. He says this because there's a deceivers who don't acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh. They've gone out into the world. These people are deceivers and antichrists. This is the problem. These people had come in. This is a, the beginning of a heresy that's going to become the Gnostic movement of the second century. And uh, the church had been around about 30 years. That's long enough, apparently, for some heresy and some corruption to begin. This is a type of docetism. That's, that's your word for the day. D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. I've used that this week. People go like, wow, you're a philosopher. 
this is a philosophy that taught that there was a dichotomy between matter and spirit. So matter was terrible, matter was evil, and our flesh, it's terrible, our spirit, that's all good. So for them, it followed then that the Christ spirit could not actually be flesh because that would take Christ's good spirit and we would put it into a physical body, which would be evil. So they taught that Christ took over a guy named Jesus's body. That when we see the baptism and the Holy Spirit came down, that's when Christ entered Jesus. And then just before the crucifixion, Christ takes off and leaves Jesus to, to deal with the stuff. The problem with that is that nullifies the atoning sacrifice of Jesus for our sin. Because then God's not involved with that at all. It's just a guy dying. That's a deception. It's false and it's contrary to the gospel and it, and it goes against the truth about Jesus and so the one who teaches this is called an Antichrist. This is not the capital A Antichrist from Revelation. This is an Antichrist, one who stands against Christ. Any teaching that goes against what the Bible says is true about Jesus is Antichrist. And John warns them, he says, don't get suckered into this. Don't lose what you've been working for. Now, we know from John's writings that he's not talking about losing your salvation. John, for John, he makes it clear that salvation is not something somebody can earn, but it's a gift from God, and therefore a genuine disciple of Jesus cannot lose his salvation. Now, John says in 1 John, and he, and he kind of is, is saying this here, if you can walk away and never come back, then you weren't one of us to begin with. You had never surrendered your life to Christ. I tell you, and I think that's the danger. If, w if you think, if we think that coming to church is what makes you a Christian, if we think that, well, I kind of, I try to live by the teachings of Christ, you can deceive yourself. And you can be open to other stuff because what you know is you know like a book about truth. But Scripture tells us that Jesus is the truth. And being a Christian is knowing Jesus. Right? And if we know Jesus, we know him experientially. That's what they're, they're talking about. And that means that we have surrendered our life to Christ. And we've said, okay, you're in charge of my life now. Because I believe that you died, because I don't understand it. I don't I understand you dying. I don't understand the resurrection. That's a little different for me. But I believe it happened. So I believe that you're who you said you were. Since I believe that up here, I'm going to surrender my life to that truth. And Scripture says that's when we call him Lord. Lord means boss, right? And so if we have said, Jesus, you're the boss of my life, you're my master, you're my Lord, then our life should reflect obedience, right? And Jesus equates that with love for him. Why? Because we love him so much, because he saved us from eternal destruction, because we love him so much, he's forgiven our sin, because he's come to reside inside of us. We're so grateful and so full of joy, we want to please him. And so we live in a way that reflects his character. And John says, if you can walk away, that's probably never happened. You might have been in love with the idea. You might have liked some stuff. You might have liked the fellowship. If you were here last week, you would have loved the food. But that would not have made you a believer. So John warns them. When he's talking about the rewards here, he's talking about the rewards that Paul wrote about in 2 Corinthians 5. Paul teaches that even as believers, we're going to stand before God to be judged, not for the purpose of of determining our eternal destiny, because that's been settled. But rather to be rewarded for the good things that we have done. Paul says it's going to be like putting a big pile of our deeds out there. And God's just going to throw a match in it. And all the things that we did with the right motive for the right reasons, they're going to be like refined gold. And the rest of the stuff is going to burn up like stubble. You know, I, I kind of envision my pile like... I'd like to think my pile's huge, right? 
and the match comes, and then I'm afraid there's going to be like a coin, a, a penny at the bottom, right? But that's what John's talking about. He's talking about we don't want to lose that reward. We don't want to lose what we've worked for. I think he may be also talking about we don't want to, we don't want to lose how the gospel is spread. We've worked to spread the gospel and the truth. We don't want to get caught up in a lie then that's going to destroy all this. That term he uses, to run ahead, means to go too far. And so it's really kind of running so far ahead that you get out of bounds. These teachers, they saw themselves as enlightened thinkers, claiming to know more than others. We don't have anybody like that in our country, thank God. But when somebody adds to the testimony of Jesus Christ, it actually subtracts from the truth of who he is and what he did. And so John gives the church some practical advice. He says, don't support these Yehu's ministry. That's a Hebrew word. So in this time, teachers and evangelists, they would travel. And they'd get in a town and they'd find a family to house them. Next week, when we look at 3 John, he's going to encourage the church to support the good teachers that come. But here he says, don't give these people a place to live and thereby support their heresy. Because if you support their ministry, then you're going to become responsible and you become a willing participant in their deception. So don't do that. Now, I have to tell you, sometimes... That passage is misapplied and abused. And it's, it's used to teach that Christians shouldn't have anything to do with non-Christians. Which makes it really hard to follow the, the, the commands of Christ to minister and to be salt and light in the world, right? That is not what John's saying. He's not saying that you can't invite your non-Christian neighbors and friends over to your house. He's not talking about interaction and ministry to those who need Christ. He's talking about supporting those who are actively teaching and spreading lies. So when you decide to support a ministry, know what they're supporting. Know who sponsors them. Know what they believe and what they teach. Don't just send your money because they have a cute ad. Or they make you cry with some sappy music while you watch. In the arms of an angel. Right? Oh, quick. I'll, just, I'll give you a couple dollars. Don't do that. Find out where the money goes and who sponsors them. Okay, Pastor. This is all very interesting. Well, what does it mean for me? What does that mean for us? Well, I think as a church, one of the things it means for us is that we should be a place of truth and love. What do I mean by that? I mean that we need to teach the truth and be loving. Truth without grace can be oppressive. It can be legalistic and judgmental and harsh. You should do this. If you don't do this, you're lousy. We need grace to temper that. But grace without truth leads to chaos. It leads to license, to the abuse of freedom. So we need truth to give us a framework. And I think for spiritual growth, we need both, right? We need truth from God to tell us this is right, this is wrong, this is where I want you to go, but we need grace to get there. So we teach truth in love. We have to teach what the Bible says. I don't get to make it up. I can't come up to you this morning going like, well, I didn't really like what the pastor said today, so I'm giving you a totally different thing. I'm making something up this morning that I like much better. I cannot do that. We have to preach and teach what the Bible says while recognizing that we are all sinners in need of His grace. So instead of the, taking the truth and beating others with it, we join together and we encourage each other. We dust each other off when we fail. We celebrate growth. We commiserate in our frailty. And, and we grow in love for God and each other. That's a corporate thing. Then I think we need to know the truth. 
right? How can we walk in the truth if we don't know the truth? What makes us a body is that each of us is each of us being in Christ because we have committed our lives to follow him. Without that truth, we're really not a church. So we acknowledge that he's God the Son, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, and he offers us forgiveness and eternal life. And we admit that we're sinners and we need forgiving and we ask him to be the leader in our life. And we're a body because we have a shared commitment to Christ and to the truth of the gospel. That's what makes us a body. Because God sends us the Holy Spirit when, to live inside of us when we commit his life to him, then we share that Holy Spirit. And so we are bonded by that. Most of us are familiar with John 14, 6, when Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. So we really cannot separate the idea of knowing the truth from knowing the one who is the truth. Jesus. I think that's one of the reasons Jesus was constantly telling his disciples to follow him rather than, hey, here's some rules I want you to follow. When we, so we see that truth is not just an abstract set of ideas. It's relational. And because the truth is relational at its core, knowing the truth requires us to spend time in God's word. And I think it requires us doing that as a community. This, this is where John's going with this. Stay together. Hang together. That's protection against deception. As most of you have probably experienced personally, when you study the Bible together with your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's an important way to stay grounded. To stay grounded in the truth and to grow. As a church, we offer you Sunday morning Bible study before the service. We offer Wednesday night Bible study. And I have to tell you, one of the things that I love, um, Wednesday night especially, because we don't have a service afterwards, and we have been known to go just a few minutes over a couple times. But the discussion of what we're studying, I learn so much from you as you share the insights that you get from a passage. And I love those moments when someone says, well, I don't understand this. And other people go, yeah, me either. Or, I didn't either, but I got this insight. And as they begin to share, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite times as a pastor to watch people grow from each other. We need to know the truth. We need to live in the truth. Knowledge of the truth is not enough. We have to put it into practice. The term that John uses, to walk, is used by a lot of New Testament writers to indicate a lifestyle. So applying what Jesus taught, applying what the apostles wrote, needs to be a continuing action. We need to embrace the truth by living, in our, living our lives in a way that is consistent with the truth found in God's word. We used hate earlier, so if you say you love Jesus and you're doing this and you and the way that you live shows that there's some people that you hate, then you are not walking in love. You're not walking in the truth. You're not living in the truth. You're saying it's truth, but you're not living in it. And you can apply that to anything that's taught there. We can't follow Jesus in isolation because so much of what he called us to do is in the context of living in relationship with other people, right? You cannot encourage on your own. There has to be a recipient to that encouragement. You can't comfort without there being somebody to comfort or serve without somebody being there to be served. You can't hold each other accountable, and I mean that in the most positive sense of encouraging each other to walk, not nitpicking each other's sins, but you can't do that by yourself. Those are just a few of the things that cannot be done without others. We cannot love without others to love. So Christian love is not just an emotion. There's an action involved. So in order to love together, we actually have to be together. So don't neglect the body life. Be at worship consistently. 
participate in Bible study, fellowship with each other. And can I say, let me add something there. Don't be afraid to be an initiator. I have some great friends who are not initiators. And if I had not taken the responsibility to say, hey, you want to go do something? We would not have been friends because they did not make a lot of effort to do that. But over the years, they've gotten a little better at it. But I see that in church. Members, people go like, well, no one's ever had us over to their house. It's not very friendly. Well, how many people have you invited over? Well, none. All right? You'd be the initiator, all right? And maybe that'll spread, and then we'll have a bunch of initiators, and you guys will be, like, living the high life all the time. Maybe hanging out with everybody all the time. But really, it, I'm serious. Be an initiator. Invite somebody. You don't have to have them over to your house. Maybe you're like some friends of ours are like, oh, don't come over to our house. It's always a mess. Well, I think we all say that probably, and so you're probably safe. Meet them somewhere for dinner. Do something with them. Maybe you can't go. Call them. We have several people right now that are isolated at home because of physical ailments. Call them. And just say, I was thinking about you today. I was praying for you. How you doing? Write them a note. It says, prayed for you today. Love you. Being remembered is so encouraging. So part of not neglecting body life, I think, is being an initiator. Try it. You'll like it. It's harder to be deceived when we're together. When we're studying God's word together, when we're worshiping together, when we're ministering side by side, sharing our struggles, sharing those times like, it's hard, I don't know, I'm frustrated, I'm angry at God. When you, when you have your Habakkuk week, like we talked about last week, and you're like, God, what are you doing? It's kind of nice to have somebody there going like, I totally get it, you know, let's go to him and complain together, or <laughs> to talk you out of it, to get you off the ledge, Right? to work through the tough times that might cause us to doubt or wrestling with the questions of how to live out our faith. When we become isolated from our church family, it's easy to become discouraged, to be disheartened and deceived. You know, after we've not been there a while, isn't it easy to go like, well, I don't know if they really like me anyway. I'm not sure I really feel apart. And that whole thought process starts, it gets easier to stay home. I don't get brownie points if everybody that says they're a member are here on Sunday. So what I'm not saying is church attendance is the most important thing you can do. I'm telling you, for your spiritual health, being with other believers is really important. And I got to tell you, I love the technology. We started long before the pandemic putting our services on Facebook. I think it's so awesome that when you're on vacation, you guys turn in and you're like, oh, that was a great sermon last week and you were in Wisconsin or you were in California or someplace. Our, our pastor friend in Zambia watches every week. We're a global church. Did you know that? We have an international TV ministry. <laughs> I think that's awesome. But can I tell you, after the pandemic, what I don't like is, mm, you yeah. know, I don't feel like taking a shower this morning. don't feel like dressing up. Let's just watch on TV. You get the sermon, but you miss out. It is different, right? It's different. Those of you that had to watch at home for a while were like, I cannot wait to get back. You know what I'm talking about, right? It is different when we sit together and sing because I promise you, if you hear me and Amy doing music on the computer... Before the sermon, you're like, let's just turn the volume down until he gets up to preach. It does not sound great. And so you don't worship the same way. And when we're together, I think God blesses that. I feel like you know, God says when there's two or three together, he's there. I, we know he's here today. But if you're at home, he's there too. But you miss out this fellowship fellowshipping with him and that is so important and john really here is saying listen stick together as a body that's the best protection you have against these false teachers right 
You know, a wolf does not attack the flock, does it? It attacks the stragglers. And so when you stay home consistently, more than you're here, you're kind of a straggler. And you're really placing yourself in spiritual danger. I don't say that as, you better, you know. This is danger, but it is, right? I know, because I've done it. I did it in seminary. What? Did he just say that he didn't go to church for a while in seminary? Yes. That's what I said. Because I worked at the switchboard, and it was good money, and it let me get a job there permanently so I could work from midnight to 4 a.m., and so I substituted all the time. The music students had to go sing somewhere on Sunday morning, so I went and worked on the switchboard and watched Charles Stanley on TV, which gave me some great sermons, but I missed out on all the stuff. I told you, I I was telling you, because I've been there. I did it. And God was like, well, I won't tell you the words he used, but he corrected me (laughs) and told me I need to get my rear end in church, especially if I was going to be a college minister or a pastor. Like, how could you do that? So I speak from experience, and I got to tell you, it's not a good place to be. You make yourself ripe for discouragement and doubt and the temptation just to be done with it all and walk away. So don't do that. Again, we've used this verse, it seems like a lot over the last three or four months, but the writer of Hebrews put it so well in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. He said, and let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray.